I welcome you to the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church. We are situated at number 19 Degan Street, Arima in Trinidad. And today, we are welcoming you to our virtual as well as our live worship service. God bless you as you enjoy this experience here at Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church of Bless. You can go home. Let us pray. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endured forever. This evening we want to thank you, Heavenly Father, for your holy Sabbath day. We thank you for helping us to see the dawn of another Sabbath. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to bless us we ask that you'll continue to take charge of this service, even now as we wait upon you. Father, we thank you for your grace that you have extended us from time to time. We thank you for this grace, family-filled service seminar that we have been attending. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will continue to lead and direct in everything that is said and done this evening. We want, in a special way, your blessing to be on the praise team. We know, Lord, that they are ministering in a special way, and we pray that as they sing praises to you, that our hearts will be blessed and refreshed, and as the minister, your Holy Spirit will make impressions upon the minds of those who hear. We pray for those who are online. We ask that you will bless them, and as they listen, may they accept the word and surrender their lives to you. Thank you for those who are here live, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to their hearts. May the words that they hear inspire them to be better families day by day as they wait upon your soon return. Father, we pray for all the families in this nation. We know that there are problems, but we are thankful that you are the great problem solver, that nothing is too hard for you, and with you, all things are possible. So we ask that you meet them at their point of need. Help them to have the assurance that you, Lord, have sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us so that we can have life and have it more abundantly. We ask, Lord, that you give us all a spirit of obedience, our willingness, so that as we hear your word, we'll obey and walk in the way that leads to life eternal. Thank you in a special way, Lord, for what has been received and what we have learned as this week progresses. We want to pray especially for Pastor Hurry, Lord, that you will continue to pass your healing balm upon him and restore him back to health. Soon we pray. We know, Lord, that you are the great healer and that you will heal him in your way and in your time. We thank you also in a special way for your man servant, Pastor Thomas. He has been bridging the gap, Lord, in the absence of Pastor Horrell. But we know, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is present with him, and that the words that he speaks will be words of light and duty. And as we hear it, we'll respond by yielding to that Holy Spirit anointing. Thank you for doing what you have done for us in the past and this week. Thank you for what you will do tonight in a special way. And as your man servant presents the word, may be presented with clarity and may it be simple and may we all understand so that when we have come to the end, we'll be able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So we ask that you take charge and take full control and may everything be done decently and in order. We give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. And we thank you in no other name but the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is our prayer, for Christ's sake. Amen and amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Ah, uh, now we feel like, you know, it's Sabbath again. You know, I'm so happy to be here yet another Sabbath where you can come and sing praises. You know, because they say in the, 
All right, so at this point in time, I remember something very, very much, that today is a very special person's birthday today, you know? That's our band member, Ayo, today is his birthday, actually. So you want to say happy birthday to him? Happy birthday, Ayo, you know? From brothers, happy birthday. All right, and at this point in time, we'll sing our first hymn, which is hymn number 382. O day of rest and gladness. will be hymn number 476. Burdens are lifted at Calvary.
the Lord. Good night everyone. I'm not hearing y'all. Good night everyone. Oh yes, we indeed are standing on the promises of, of God indeed. Good night and happy Sabbath to all of you who are right here at the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church and to our friends who are online. We wish you a warm happy Sabbath and welcome to the Grace Filled Family Series where to becomes one. Oh yes, indeed, I am here tonight alone. Karina could not make it tonight. She sends her regards, but indeed she sent her representative and myself to do her part. Indeed, at this Family Life Series 2 indeed has become one. Well, thank you friends for joining us online and those of you who are here. I want to do at this time the roll call. So if you hear your name, you can say present in the chat or you can say present even online. And we start with the first name, Vernus Lessie. Present, praise the Lord. She's right here at the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church. Colleen Elms, Claire Joseph, Anne Cordner, Sherry Ann Daniel, Kelsia Bonaparte, Petronella Augustus, our very ubiquitous Jennifer Jack. Our first commenter award goes to Claudia Daniel, and of course, none other than Karen Romeo. So if you heard your name, but present. Now, if you didn't hear your name, remember this is a random selection. We want all of you who are online and present just to type present in that chat so that we can see who is actively listening and present here tonight. Well, friends of mine, I have a bit of information for you all. You cannot afford to be late to tomorrow morning's program. You cannot afford. You want, if you want to come 8 o'clock, come 8 o'clock. We're not starting 8 o'clock. 
But if you, as early as possible, you can come. We start around 9, 9.15 in the morning. Uh, we invite you to come here because we intend to finish at 11 a.m. promptly. All right. We have the End It Now motorcade that's taking place tomorrow. The men and women ministry de departments of the South Caribbean Conference will be putting on a motorcade which starts from the Arima bus terminal and it will be starting at 12 noon. It's in support of domestic violence and sending and spreading that message out there. And so they ended now rally and consequently, because of the rally starting at 12, we would be ending here at 11 a.m. to accommodate persons who would like to go and support such a worthy cause. Well, friends, tonight our topic is principles of a healthy marriage principles of a healthy marriage at this time you are called to action yes our friends online you know what it is by now you've been looking you've been coming night after night you know what the call to action is like this video share it so that someone else can hear about this gospel and we also want you to do what turn up the volumes on those devices so that those who are in earshot can also be blessed by the gospel. Well, night after night, we ask you all questions, as you all know, we, we, and you ask the evangelist questions as well. But tonight, the question went out to you, and this is the question. According to studies, what do you think is the minimum number of years dating that puts a relationship at an advantage, the minimum number of years. And this is what you said, take a look. I think probably one and a half years to maybe two years, but it doesn't get advantage. One year. I would say three years. Well, you should date for two years. After two years, it's I would say three years. Two years. Three years. So there you have it, friends. That's it right there. Pastor said how many years? Three years. We had varying um, responses, and we thank you again for all those responses. The the minimum number of years that puts a relationship at an advantage. That's what you said. Well, friends, our evangelist, Pastor Kurt Thomas, who has taken over, take, handed over the baton, or taken the baton from Pastor Horrell, is here tonight. He's ready to answer questions. But before we get to that, we have a gospel minister to minister our hearts in song. At this time, I invite you to welcome our dear sister, Marissa Waldron Mark Williams. A pleasant good night to everyone and happy Sabbath. You may be down and feel like God has somehow forgotten that you are faced with circumstances you cannot get through right now it seems there's no way out and you're going under god has proven time and time again he'll take care of you you again oh, oh, oh if you just take one look at where you're now and where you've been hasn't he always come through for you he's the same now as then That 
you're going through, he knows how your hurts You see, he knows just how your heart has been broken in two. He's the God of the stars, the sun and the sea, and he is your father. storm, then he'll find a way to come and fix things for you, you, he'll do it again, oh yes, he'll do it again, if you just take one look at where you're now, and where you've been, he always come through for oh, you. He's the same God now as then. Oh, oh, you may not know how, you may not know when, but God will do it again. Oh, he's still Praise the Lord. Lord. He will do it again. You may not know how, you may not know when, but God has promised He will do it again. Friends, we are happy tonight because our viewership has just crossed 100. Oh, praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. And um, I, I want you to know that Karina, though she is not here, she is here. She is not here physically, but she is here in, in, in thought. Because she just messaged me, very excited. You all are getting our hostess excited. She's, she messaged me very excited, saying it's crossed 100. We are at 115. And friends, we want you all to continue to share the link. Remember, these are not just numbers. These are souls that are hearing the gospel. To all of you who are online, just share that link. Because someone will be blessed by the proclamation of the word tonight. Well... We have our evangelist, Pastor Kurt Thomas, ready on hand to answer your questions tonight. Good evening, Pastor. Good evening, Jaden. How are you doing? Happy Sabbath. I'm quite fine. And you? I'm fine. Thank you. Happy Sabbath to those who are here and even online. Thank you so much for stopping by and tuning in to the Arima Seventh-day Adventist Church in Graceville Family Live Series. Pastor, mm -hmm. our first question tonight goes as follows. Good evening, Pastor. I am truly enjoying your series online. I have a question for you. 
You said last evening, submission is critical for the success of every marriage. Now, what should I do if my husband wants sex every night? Even though I try to explain how tired I am from work, he gets vexed. Pastor, I don't know how long I can go on with this submission. <laughs> Have mercy. Ooh, where's Pastor Horrell? <laughs> Ooh, so let's, let's take it from the latter part. Now, um, the, the whole idea about it, submission is required for both entities in terms of male and female for this particular activity. Um, however, if it is that someone is having this challenge, it means to say that someone is trying to have overcompensation of some insecurity in terms of using it as now no longer a romantic um, um, aspect, but more of a tour to duty for self-gratification. One may argue the fact and say, but pastor, some people have appetites larger than others. That may be true. But you have to understand, we are seeing in this question that somebody is not paying attention to the other individual. They have now come to the point of, listen, okay, I will use what I have because I'm overcompensating for something. Whatever that is, you need to be able to find your counselor and talk to that person. Not only that, economically and financially in the world, you know, the whole aspect of finances have changed. It has impacted the family in so many ways. And you find that women now have to go out and work to be able to assist to be that help me, to be that easer, as it were, to a husband and to the household, to be able to acquire and fulfill certain goals that they, the couple would have. So certainly there seemed to be some measure of um, overcompensation in some way or the other where someone is uh, more or less uh, more self. Because you must be able to bear in mind as you go, grow in a relationship, we expect as counselors, as it were, for the first Two years of marriage, uh, we expect the peaking of sexual desires, and after that, we have a drop in the graph, which is which is quite normal. And as you grow older and older, the graph drops a little more. Amen. And um, as such, the thing about it is that um, we know that you know because of the fact, if you were to look at a girl child, every seven years a female changes. They go into a different realm. Right. Let me, let me, can I break it down a little bit? So when the child or a girl child is from one to seven, she's a child. Another seven years, she's 14. She's both child and young woman. Then she goes from 14 to 21. She's now into a different setting, a different maturity. So they mature a lot faster. Another seven years will take them into what you call um, their heightened sexual experience from 30 to 35. And after which, they then go for another seven years and they enter into earning menopausal. These are things that men and women have to talk to. Don't just take it for granted that's a woman thing and hear it, well, you got to deal with your thing. No. As a loving husband, as a loving, kind person, and you love your wife, you would sit and you will be able to understand the different stages that they are going through, as well as men. Men, of course, they go and they peak early, and as such, by the age of 27 or so, they are fully mature as a man to really take on marriage, etc. And then from 27 going on, they peak, and then they drop, and then they will peak again. All right? And the thing about it is that this is conversation that a husband and wife need to have. Don't just take it for granted. And then, ladies, there are help out there in terms of when you reach those particular age groups. They are helped by get your family um, medical doctor to talk with, and you can get some help in that regard together also with men. You know the book of Proverbs, chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. What does the Bible say? The book of Proverbs, chapter 5, verse 18 and 19, it says, Let thy fountain be blessed, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as a loving hind and pleasant roe. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times, and be thou ravish also always with her love. Um, this is critical. In other words, allow yourself to be able to bask. In the, in the romance and love of your married wife. Did you hear what I just said? 
your only wife, that is. And um, be able to be understanding as to what is going on. And um, because you're hearing a, a, a plea here, I'm tired from work and this man, and he gets vexed. Uh, that's not healthy. That is not being under the submission of the Lord Almighty. For when you're under the submission of God, you will understand that you not only uh, care about yourself, but you care about the other. Be patient with them and know, hey, I'm, she's tired. You know, God is going to take care of me. The book of Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 27 answers it beautifully, Jaden. It answers it beautifully. It says, it is not good. Hmm. Did you hear that? It is not good to eat much honey. Mm -hmm. Somebody say amen. Amen. So for men to search their own glory is not what? Glory. So if it is that you're only seeking your glory, then the Bible is saying it is not good for you to eat much honey. In other words, temperance. Somebody say amen. This crowd, this audience and congregation is very quiet. I'm not sure if I answered the question. I know the chat is getting hot there, Jada. <laughs> yes, it's indeed. getting hot. I, I, I could actually see somebody on that chat say, Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Have mercy. <laughs> Let's go. Next question. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Pastor, I think you may have persons lined up at your office later. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Based upon the, the, the questions. No problem. And we really have some really interesting questions here this evening. The next one is as follows. Good evening, Pastor. When do men grow up? My mm. husband seems to think that his friends are more important than me. Can you explain when do men grow up? Mm-hmm. When do men grow up? Hmm. This is a worldwide question that always seems to surface. The understanding is that you have men, as it were, that are still behaving like boys. Am I talking the truth? You know, the Bible says in 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, it says, when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I taught as a child. But when I became a man, I put away what? Childish things. You see, today, we have, bo we, we have boys who never became men. They have created a name for themselves known as dudes. Are you hearing me? You see, boys who can shave, most guys feel they are good husbands if they provide food and shelter for their families, and that has become the standard. But I want to say it this evening, as we look at this question, men, that most animals give their offspring food and shelter as well. If that is the bar we want to be able to exemplify manhood, then we have missed the mark. Did, are you hearing me? You see, a true man is a servant leader. A true man lead spiritually a true man is romantic and a true man take on responsibility you see boys blame but men take responsibility okay boys take but men give boys complain but men figure out boys give up but men endure boys wish but men do boys start but men finish all right boys stiffen their necks but men bend their knees. Oh, yes. There we have it. Yes, Jaden. The chat is hot. It's lit, Pastor. We have actually have persons in the chat here mentioning concerning men not growing up. Someone says, most do not. <laughs> have mercy. And we have persons saying, mercy with these questions. Other persons asking, yes, yes, please answer. And thank you, friends, again for sharing with us in the chat. We do see all of you in the chat, all of you who said that you are present. Let me just go through a couple of you who said you are present um, that I didn't mention. Sister Stephanie Quintero, Monica Weeks, um, Sister Margaret Scipio, and we want to say a special good night to our dear friend, Pastor Ricky Ramguli is in the chat, hot in the chat there. Good night to you, Pastor. 
And of course, we want to say a special happy birthday to our dear band member and question answerer, um, Brother Ayodele Gabriel. Well, friends of mine, buckle up, get ready, because we are about to get into the meat of the matter this evening. Uh, but before we do so, we would allow you to join us this evening as we take up an offering this evening. Father, once again, we give thee thanks, praise, honor, and glory for life. You made us in your image and likeness. You gave your only begotten Son as an act of love. We ask this evening, as we give to you, it will be from hearts of love. We ask that you bless it, and that as you bless it, we will be blessed also. You have said that God loves a cheerful giver. Let us give joyfully as unto the Lord, and may you bless it and bless us and save us, we pray, for Christ's sake. Amen. your presence, you alone are worthy of all reverence. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve Serve the Lord as for me. 
very much, praise team. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed as we get into this particular message. Eternal Father, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, God, for the insight in your word to help us to have better families. Thank you, God, for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. As we look into this evening's topic is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Good evening again to everyone. Happy evening, everybody. And I say happy Sabbath as well to each and every one of you. To our online viewers, I want to say happy Sabbath to you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this series. And we are, of course, being able to unpack certain truths from the Bible as it relates to our families. If you have been enjoying the experience thus far, would you just wave? Wave back at me, those who are in the congregation. If you are online, you just put a thumbs up, put a, uh, some type of face, just indicating that you appreciate these meetings. And certainly, I am happy and delighted to be delivering on behalf of God. We thank God for Pastor Harrell as he continues um, his journey in terms of his health. And we thank God for him and his family. This evening, we are going to unpack uh, this interesting topic, Principles for a Healthy Marriage. Uh, principles for a Healthy Marriage. I want us to be able to go to the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 2. What book did I say? Uh, Genesis chapter 2. And we are going to go to the Bible now. And I'm going to read in your hearing the book of Genesis, chapter 2. It says, And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord had taken from man, he made into a woman. And he brought her to the man. It says, and Adam said, you got to read it how the Bible puts it in quotation mark. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24 says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25 then says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This evening we are going to look at two questions from these verses. The first question is, what do we need in order to be successful in our marriage? The other question is, how can we have a healthy marriage? For us to be able to unpack uh, this particular topic as it relates to the principles for a healthy marriage, we must underscore from the Word of God the first principle is that we need to be aware of idolatry in marriage. We need to be what? Aware of idolatry in marriage. You see, in a wedding, the father has the honor of bringing his daughter to the groom. As a matter of fact, the father uh, takes steps of being proud in some instances to give his daughter away. In some other instances, fathers have cried. Fathers sometimes even refuse to walk their daughters down the aisle. But when we look at Scripture, we realize that God the Father played this significant role because he gave Eve to Adam. Would you say amen? And so it is that when Adam saw Eve, he went directly into poetry. He says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh 
of my flesh. I am not sure whether that lyrics, Brother Cillan, can work with the young ladies these days. Are you hearing me? I'm not sure, Brother Javal, that that lyrics can work these days. Probably you will have to use another lyrics, which I really don't know because of my age at this time. But even when in my time I was courting Rene, I couldn't use you are now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She would have looked at me and said, what bone are you talking about? Now, the first Hebrew word in the poem is at last. I know it is translated in the English as this is now. But that word now, which can be translated at last or finally, means Adam is saying, this is what I've been looking for. Have mercy. You guys understanding the lyrics? Ah, I'm seeing a young lady in front. She's smiling. Oh, yes. In other words, when a man decides that he's taken that big step in order to marry a woman, he's saying, you are the person I have been waiting for all my life. Ask Brother Brumble and Sister Brumble. Somebody say amen. Brother Brumble, wave. Oh, yes. Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. It's a po po poetic way of saying, as I see you, I now know who I am. I have found myself in you. I'm not just coming to another person. I'm coming to someone who is helping me see who I am. And that is what marriage is about. That's what looking for a wife is all about. At last, I am discovering who I am. I am now being able to find out really and truly who or what compliments me. That is what he's saying, and it's so powerful. Let's just take a moment to notice that this happened in paradise, where Adam has a perfect relationship with God, yet he's responding to romance and ma marriage like this. You see, you may think your biggest problem, spiritually speaking, is the prospect of a bad marriage. But the prospect of a good marriage is ever bit in a spiritual danger if it is that we don't fully understand who we are marrying and why we are marrying. Did you hear what I just said? You know, it was John Newton wrote to a young couple saying that his biggest problem practically in his life has been idolatry with regard to his wife and his marriage. He says there's something about marriage that can be so powerful and so fulfilling that unless you deliberately stop it, you would look at your spouse to give you the things only God can really give you. Did you all hear that? You will look to your spouse for your spouse's love, your spouse's respect, your spouse's affirmation to give you meaning in life and a foundation of your own sense of value to give you all of the things you should only be getting from God. Is that not true? Many people operate like that. They're in marriage to see what they can get. Are you hearing me? Not realizing that the person you are marrying have defects just like yourself. They are in need as well. There are some men and women in marriage because of their love language, if it is that the man or the woman doesn't affirm them, they feel lost. So if she doesn't say, baby, I love how your triceps and your biceps are coming out, even though he's getting a punch, but she cannot be truthful with him and say, boy, you need to stop drinking the juice and stop eating so much flour. She has to mama guy him and say, I like you, but what you're technically doing is allowing me to eat more. Are you hearing me, people? Marriage demands face-to-face -face talk, hard talk as it were. Say, baby, I love you, but I'm seeing the punch coming. You're losing the six-pack, which I, I thought you had, and I, I was attracted by that. Let me tell you something. Let me talk the truth tonight. Somebody say, amen. I need to get home now. I have to go home. Some years ago, I was faced with a tragedy. When I looked into the mirror, and I saw something start to 
disintegrate. It was my curls. Somebody say amen. Oh gosh, you all listen to me now. It's painful. You all don't understand what a bald head man, how did this go through, you know? And then my wife one day looked at me and she said, Baby, you know why I was attracted to you? You're curly here. Brethren, Craig, that was harsh. Automatically, I felt like my, my, the, 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 the fear follicle in my head started to cry. Because I couldn't believe my, 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 my one and only sweetheart, darling, is telling me she was attracted to my hair. So now she has to find something else to be attracted to. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. That is what love is about. Are you hearing me? The truth is you won't say that to yourself and you won't say that to other people, but you'll be doing it. And you may not even be aware that you are doing it. It's because marriage is such a powerful thing. It's such an attractive thing. It is a great thing. Somebody say amen. That's why John Newton says, Lord, save us from the wonderfulness of marriage. In fact, this kind of idolatry happens even if your marriage is bad. Because the disappointment of your marriage not fulfilling all your needs as you expected is a heavy weight to bear. You see, those unfulfilled expectations can crush your marriage. Nobody can bear the weight of those expectations and the hope of ultimate joy. The criticisms of your spouse will crush you. The problems of your spouse will crush you. In other words, when you're entering into a marriage, the spouse that you are marrying also have problems. You are not going to get a perfect person. You should not be marrying because you want a psychologist or psychiatrist. Somebody say amen. Some years ago, I remember a couple. And this lady, you know, she was in church and stuff. I wouldn't call the church. But every time she got up to give testimony, she would have to always affirm her husband. She cannot give a testimony on her own. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? Not that she's being, you know, but sometimes the testimony doesn't correlate with what she wants to say. But in the testimony, she always has to try to bring him up, to let him be part of her experience. That's problematic. If you have an experience with your God, say your experience, amen. But you could also thank God for your husband, yes. But not every testimony. Well, I want to thank my husband. And let me tell you something. That chap was one who used to give trouble in church, you know. You said give real trouble. I mean, you should know. Be able to come straight out with your husband and say, listen, baby, I love you, but there are some things in you you've got to change. Somebody say amen. I'm attracted to you. I love you. And it's only because I love you, I want to tell you the truth. Have you not realized that some people, when they get a little older, they, uh, have you met some of those? They start talking about, so when it is that he asks, a couple, go and get up and go and get your own Tina. They had that long time to say no. Long years ago, they had that to say no. Eh? He, the, the man lie down, he take his foot, he put it over you. Boy, move your whole foot from by me. You didn't know the man foot was all years ago? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you hearing me, people? You know, you know there, 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 there was a couple in which that I had, you know, and... Um, as uh, such, they gave me permission to share this in my family life um, series, and I'm comfortable doing it. Um, and as such, you know, they, they, uh, um, she was one who idolized her husband. She came from humble dwellings, and that gentleman really talked, man, and he convinced her, I promise I'll send you to do this. You'll drive. You'll, I'll take you. We'll go to Paris and what have you. When he got married to her and he had children with her, he never did one thing for her. And she gave her all, making sure she cooked, sweep, did everything. When he came in, she put the food on the table and everything. But none of her dreams ever materialized. So she was making him happy and she died an unhappy soul. Dreams that were never fulfilled. 
Because sometimes as men, we have good tongues. Somebody say amen. We could sweet talk a bumblebee. Are you hearing me, people? And as such, we are able to get the woman, as it were, to believe in all the promises. Let me tell you something. If you cannot carry the woman to Paris, don't tell her to carry her Paris. Tell her you'll carry her to Tobago. Tobago can also be Paris. Somebody say amen. Are you hearing me in the house? Speak the truth at all times. Are you hearing me, people? What happened with that lady? She made her husband... So, you listen, I could remember visiting, her, visiting them at home. And the only thing that poor soul, that lady could talk about was him. If it is that he went out, she concerned when he coming back. If it is that he... he, he, he listen, let me, let me tell you something, brethren. Let me, let me tell you something. You should not love it. I'm not, don't get me wrong out there now. You should love your husband, love your wife, but don't put them much more than God in your life. Too many people are living like that. They don't even have a self-identity. Are you hearing me? Ladies have to wait and watch the husband and you have to, let me tell you something. When I do communications with my couples, I teach them to communicate with their eyes, you know. Are you hearing me, people? So in other words, if you are in public and you are doing something or saying something and she looks at you in a particular way, you know she's saying, don't say it. Somebody say amen. Are you hearing me? She's not telling you to sit down and stay quiet, you know. She technically telling you, wait till we get home. Renee, are you watching me like that right now? Secondly, the next point we have, we need patience. We need what? Oh, the principle of biblical marriage is understanding that patience is for the long haul. The Bible text says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 18, The Lord God said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, last evening, you would remember, we spoke about helper, the woman as a helper. The Hebrew word is a which implies there's something superior in her because it means that the man is incomplete and insufficient without her. Are you listening to me? In other words, God made man. He said, I am happy. I am, I, I, I am happy that I made man, but, but there's a, a deficit in man which yearns for something, yearns for companionship. God made woman, and, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But yet still, there's a yearning in a woman for some measure of companionship. Are you hearing what I am saying? In other words, what the woman brings into the man's life is strength. Mm -mm. I, let me repeat it now. Jadon did not with me. In other words, what the woman brings into the man's life is strength. But it's, it's, it's a certain kind of strength. Do you see that the word suitable? Some translation tried to translate it by saying, I will make a helper fit for him. I will make a helper meet for him. That's the Old Testament KJV. A help meet, as it were. I will make a helper suitable for him. There are actually two Hebrew words there that the word suitable is trying to translate. The Hebrew literally saying, I will make a helper like opposite him. Did you hear me? Like opposite him. Wait a minute. Is it like or is it opposite? Someone may be thinking it can be like an opposite, but actually it can if she compliments him, you see, the two pieces of a puzzle do not fit together if they are identically right. So let's unpack that a little bit. In other words, your wife could never be you. Don't try to make her you. Don't try to make him you. In other words, she is different. You are different. And God made it that way. And it's only the power of God that fused that together. Are you hearing me, people? So don't try to change the woman. Don't try to change the man and feel how people can change is through 
the relationship with Jesus in your life. Amen? On the other hand, they can't just be different in general. They have to be rightly different. They have to be like opposite. They have to be perfectly complementary. You know, I want to be able to show you something. And this is another truth for dear. Illustration, slide 12. You know, if you watch this, you would say, how to fold laundry like me. Uh-huh. Now you're going to get something here. It says fold in half, fold in quarters, put it on the pile, watch as my wife angrily refolds it. Now let me tell you something. I must confess. I must confess. Ah, oh boy. Jesus. Hmm. Again, some hot chocolate tonight. Would you say amen? Outside in the foyer. Outside in the foyer. Let me be careful now. Let me be careful. Let me be careful. I don't know where these sanctimonious minds are going tonight, but we have, we have hot chocolate in the foyer. Somebody say amen. Let me tell you something. I am guilty of maintaining my clothes folded. I sweep, I mop, I cook, I wash the laundry, I clean the yard, I power wash, I... Do I have a witness in the church? Yeah, I, I do all the masculine things. I'm a man. But welcome to my clothes, brother Dennis, in my drawer. Sister Rene, is how many years we married, girl? She's still fighting with that. So they will be folded... And I am going to get something. But sometimes, especially in my field of work, sometimes you have to rush because it's appointment time, it's funeral, it's wedding, it's family life series. You want to get the matching from, from toe to head, as it were. So you want to get the colors matching, you know. So, so when you're looking for a specific thing, you know what I'm talking about, you just push that there and push that, and you, ah, you understand what I'm saying. But, 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 but then you hear Sister Tom, so why you have to be so untidy? I take my time and fold up this clothes how many times, and, and like you don't care? Baby, I do care, it's just nature. You have to pray and fast for me. Somebody say amen. Fix it, Jesus. You know, and you see, if Rene was making me a God and not having God in her life to be patient with me, by now my clothes would have been in a card box. Somebody help me in the church now. She would say, seeing that you cannot keep the drawer tidy, then you need to have a card box to take care of your stuff. But it's the love of God, would you say, Amen. And you see, that's what makes the difference. Have you not seen or experienced your neighbor one day you were sitting, it happened to, you know, being a PK for many years, as, as it were. We, were, we lived several places. And I, I distinctly remember a, a neighbor uh, um, was, you know, we were inside and we heard commotion. And when we, we came out, you know, uh, as curious neighbors, as it were, we saw the man's clothes being flown from the house straight into the road. And guess why? Because he wouldn't keep it tidy in his closet. The wife say, I had enough of this. On the other hand, they can just be different in general. They have to be rightly different. Are you hearing me, people? They have to be like opposites. They have to be perfectly complementary. So here's what we are being told. God is sending to Adam's life someone with enormous power. Are you hearing me? But power... That is very different. Like opposite. What does this help do? The poem tells you what happens. Into your life in marriage comes a person of a different gender. A person with mysteriously profound differences that are really almost impossible to define. As soon as you try to define the differences between a male and a female, it never quite fits. And it never will until Jesus comes again. Are you hearing me, people? You see, in marriage, a person comes into your life with a very radical, a radically different view of you, of the world, a person of different gender, of equal power, equal resources, but incredibly different. 
and you are thrown into an incredibly close relationship. Let me tell you something. As you grow in marriage, you should always appreciate your spouse even more. Amen? Now, there are some things that they, you know, after a while they get, they, they, they tolerate. Did you hear what I just said? The word is what? Tolerate. And because of love, they pray about it and they say, listen, you know what? Let me leave him alone. Let me, let me leave her alone and let's look at the positivity in the relationship. But many couples strive on the negativity in marriage too much. So throwing out the clothes is not an answer. Are you hearing me? Taking the clothes and putting it out. No, you talk, you talk, just stop talking. And one day he would fold it up. And there are some days I fold it up. But it goes back the same way eventually. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Thirdly, we need to be fully known, yet not rejected. We need to be what? Fully known, yet not rejected. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. This describes how Adam and Eve, the first proto prototype human couple, lived their lives before one another. This is the ideal not only for marriage, but also for other human relationships. You see, all of us need partners in life who know the whole truth about us, yet accepts us. And that is the biggest problem. Some people don't want to accept their spouse for who they are. Let me tell you something. When I'm doing counseling, I don't go around the merry-go-round, you know. I don't go into this love jargon and he loves you, she loves you. Okay, let's get married. And only love and only love, love, love. No. I deal with hardcore issues. Amen. I go straight to it one time. I tell you, listen, if you don't like something in this person, no, it's better you get out because it multiplies by 10 when you get married. If it is that he's talking to you rough now, what do you think will happen when it is that, that you get married? Double time, it multiplies by 10. So instead of talking to your rough, he goes, are you hearing me, people? Are you hearing me? In other words, he changes. You need to be able to understand that what you see is what you're going to get. But you see, you see, listen, 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 listen. Ladies and or women fall prey to this because women always feel they could fix. So you give them a house that have the window falling down. They, you give them a house that not painted because you see a woman is able to express herself through her surroundings. Which brings me to a salient point. When it is the Bible says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. That is talking about intimacy. That is talking about you and her together, making decisions together, not mother-in-law and father-in-law. Somebody say amen. Mother-in-law and father-in-law have no right. So even though you inherit a house from mommy, and mommy painted yellow, Know that when that woman marry you, she changing that color. She doesn't want to see anything what your mother had. She wants her own identity. So don't tell the woman that we're not changing the sofa. We're not changing the chairs. We're not changing the dining table. Because all of that speaks about your mother. She wants her own dining set. Come on now, Dennis. She wants her own living room set. Some, somebody say Amen. Don't let her live in the pity of your mother. Sometimes when you're married, Shiraz boy, and sometimes you say certain things, you know. You know how married people go. Sometimes they watch you so, especially when they're short. Somebody say amen. And they cock their hand and fit it here. And they pose like this. And they say, your feel is your mother you're talking to? Let me tell you something, brethren. Marriage is beautiful in the Lord. For when she does that, I say, baby, you're looking nice. Somebody say amen. Dr. Paul Tripp. Oh, yes. In the book, Dangerous Calling, 
tells of a time when he and his wife were getting along very poorly. At the time, he was a, a successful and beloved pastor to his congregation. In the eyes of the members of his church, he could do no wrong. But his home life told a different story. Because with his family and especially in his marriage, he was an angry man. Once during a heated argument with his wife, he told her that you should be thankful because 95% of the women in the church would give anything to have a husband like me. To this, she responded. To this, she responded. That was among, I am, a, I am among the 5%. Dr. Tripp said that these words from his wife cut him deeply in the moment, but work like a scalpel than a sword for him. In other words, he's saying that the reality of who you are must be told by your spouse. Don't be afraid to tell your spouse, I'm praying for this matter in your life. You have an anger issue. You, 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 you're, you're dropping the ball here. Don't allow your spouse to continue even in the relationship and going out there and feeling that, listen, I have it all together. Brethren, we all have faults. We all are sinners saved by grace. There is no perfect marriage on earth. I was doing a wedding. I was doing a wedding in the northeastern area of Trinidad. And I did the wedding and I, there was a couple uh, that I did the wedding and I did a sermon and what have you. And then a mature couple walked up to me and told me, Pastor, you know, we heard your sermon and what have you, but we have something to tell you. I said, go ahead. They said, Pastor, we never, ever, since we are married, ever had a quarrel. I looked at them and I said, please forgive me due to all respect. You both lie. You know why? Two different people will always differ unless one is so submissive that what, whatever the other says, they go. Not necessarily that they are happy. But they are swallowing it and waiting for the right opportunity to get out of it. Are you hearing me, people? Never be afraid to allow yourself to be vulnerable to your spouse in the reality of him or her. It will only serve to build you. I must say, and let me tell you something, all of us have defects from our parents. All of us are wired and cultured by the parents we had. Let me tell you something. Unless you are not open to education or get family life therapy or, or have some counseling, we all are just clones of our parents. And the only way we can change that it's consciously taking a decision to change. And not for your partner. You are changing because you want to change to be a better person in God. Are you hearing me, people? Finally, we need supernatural humility. Did you hear? And this is indicated in the beginning of the passage where it says, The Lord God said it is not good for man to be alone. Now, this is, first of all, a surprising statement because... Up to that time in the creation, everything God had made, he said, it was good. And this was the first time he said, it is not good. So that, that was surprising. Secondly, what was really surprising about it was, is the understanding that there was, there seemed to indicate there was unhappiness in paradise. Why would Adam be lonely? Why would he be lacking anything in paradise? There's only one possible answer. God deliberately made him to need someone beside God. Are you hearing me? You want me to read that over? God deliberately made him to need someone besides God. Or, don't get me wrong, we all need God. He made us to need him. And he's the foundation of every relationship. But think about this. This was the most humble act you could imagine. 
the most unself-centered act you could, you could imagine, that God made human beings to need not just Him, but other human beings, other relationships, other selves, other hearts. This shows how humble, how other-centered, how other-oriented, how sacrificial God is. It's not compared to what we see later. You see, when in the Bible God says repeatedly in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Hosea, I am the bridegroom, and you, my people, are the bride. Do you know what that is teaching? It's teaching two things. One, first of all, it's teaching we need to have a God in our lives. Let me tell you something. You cannot navigate marriage without God. Are you hearing me? Some of you online may say, Pastor, that's not true. I have had a blissful marriage and what have you, and I'm not in church and what have you. Let me tell you something. It's not complete until you're in Jesus. I always tell my couples that. I said, when you do the right thing, you would see how God just opens doors and windows because marriage is a covenant and God don't mess with this covenant. There are blessings in a covenant relationship. That's why the Sabbath, is a covenant with God. Somebody say amen. So too is our marriage. Yes, we need to have God in our lives just as just someone you believe in. Just as someone you try to obey, you need God in your life as your spouse. He's the ultimate help meet we need. He's like you, but he's not you. He's like you because you are in his image. That means you're personal and relational. Just as he's personal and relational, but he's not like you because God is holy. So there's no other help meet you need in your life like God. You'll never become the person you're supposed to be unless he comes into your life. Not just as a kind of an abstract principle of love or somebody you kind of would like to obey in a general way. He's saying here in John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In other words, to get through marriage, you must have the word of God in you. Let me tell you something, people. After, after having beautiful years of marriage, and um, you know, it has its ups and its downs, like any other marriage. Don't feel because you're a pastor, you don't go through it. You know, you put heads. But what, but what makes it special is when you realize what Christ did for you in your imperfection. And when you, when you look at what Christ has done for you, you realize, listen, I have defects. And because I have defects, I cannot look in my spouse for perfection. Because she's a human being just as I am in need of a Savior. So what you quickly do, if your wife offends you, you let her know. Don't go by mommy and tell mommy. Are you hearing me? You know, we have some guys who everything they run and tell mommy. Am I talking it true? Everything they're whispering in mommy. Yeah. Mommy, you know, she do me this, she do me that. I always tell the mother-in-laws, send him back. Tell him, I don't want to hear. Go back because you chose it. You chose the person. Go deal with it. Amen? Don't come and be always, if you know, I can't take a man that everything in the relationship, you had to, I can't take, I can't take it. Are you hearing me? Everything you want to, listen to me. Be a man. Stand up as it were and be able to ask God to guide you, God to lead you and fix your first church, which is your marriage, before you can fix any other church. Somebody say amen. Amen. The second thing, that this teaches us, he has given us his heart. God has given us his heart. And that because of this, you know, a groom doesn't ask a woman to marry him unless he has given her his heart. In other words, when you're courting, Jack boy, you hear me boy? Hmm. You remember them days boy? When you're trying to get Candy's heart boy, and she watching your son, she's saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But you try and you try and today, look, she put in her hand behind your head there. Somebody say amen. Somebody say amen. <laughs> in other words, 
In other words, when it is that you understand that God has given you his heart and how you should handle it, so too you are able to handle your spouse's heart. Be gentle. Be gracious. Let me tell you something, men. To be a priest in your home means to say you have to be like Jesus. Even though she doesn't want to say sorry, you have to be able to rise higher as the priest. You know, one of the things that in my personal relationship that my wife and I battled with in early in our marriage was she came from a home that if it is, or she went to, right, so I can say it, right. So, so she came from a home that, um, she came from a home where when they are vexed, they square off and they don't talk. I came from a home that we say what we had to say now. Our next couple seconds, we go. We talk it normal. So when we got married, come on now, that's after we come up on the altar and we say, I do. And I gave her my heart. Mm -hmm. And she have the heart. And then she started to see some characteristics of Kurt Thomas. <laughs> and she, she, you know, she square off and she couldn't understand. And we will now have a little conflict. And I come back and say, babes, so don't call me babes. So I say, but, but don't touch me. So, so, so I watch her and say, but Lord, what I'll do with this body? What, what I'll do here? I'm not accustomed to that. I accustom that we say what we have to say, Sister Dennis, and we move on. All the time in court in, when it is that we have a little fallout, we patch up quick, 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 because you know I had to drop her home by your mother, so she can't hold that, you know. So I thinking, we could get into marriage. I see, I trying to, don't touch me. Sleep a little more so. So I said, um, what is going on here? What is going on here, Lord? What is going on? So I, um, I, 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 you know, but I had to work by prayer and be the Jesus. So I, I, I started to show her that the Jesus principle, that in spite of... That, that, that in spite of that she would square off, I started to show her that, listen, even though you're upset about something I did, there are other things around the relationship we can, even though we can't talk about this, Nate, you know, because it's a little sensitive, we can afford to, you know, enjoy the other parts of the relationship. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to say that my wife has passed that hurdle. She can get vexed now, and in tutus, baby, so, so, so. Can I, sure, you can touch me. Somebody say amen. <laughs> You understand? But what I'm talking about, people, what I'm talking about here is that when it is that you give your heart to someone, take care of it. Don't trample on it, but firstly give your heart to God, and by extension, God will help you to navigate the heart of your spouse. Now, because God is perfect and holy, and his love is perfect, he has a sense of betrayal and grief far greater than you would, would feel if human spouses were, was unfaithful to you. Now you can understand the whole history of the Bible and the reason why God came to the earth in the person of Jesus Christ. John 1 says, he came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He was trying to get us, his, way, his waymark bride, back. But we didn't just spur or be able to react in a positive way. What we did, we nailed him to a cross. Some of you may be experiencing bad marriages. And you may think, oh, my spouse is crucifying me over and over again. But in God's case, it actually happened because he was crucified for you and for me. When he was on that cross looking down, realizing what it would take for him to stay and love us to the end, guess what? In spite of the crucibles, he stayed. And because Christ stayed, you can stay in your marriage. His love was the ultimate spousal love. He's the man. He's the spouse. He has no illusions. He don't expect us to be perfect. He knows we are not perfect. He loves us, not because we are lovely, and not because we are going to give him so much affirmation. He 
He loves us to make us lovely. He loves us for our sake, not for His sake. So He's the perfect spouse and He's the perfect helpmeet. He has come into our lives and He has gone to the cross and He has died on the cross for our sins. Friends, tonight, Jesus is the ultimate family life counselor. Would you put your hands together for Jesus tonight? Would you put your hands? He's the one that can navigate every marriage and allow you to stay. If you feel those crucibles are rough, remember the nails that went through his hand. Remember the nails that went through his feet. Remember the piercing on his side. But you know what? He stayed there on that cross because he remembered you and I. He remembered that later down, we can look at that old rugged cross. For an example, Amen. our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed as we talk to God. Eternal Father, we thank you for the principles of marriage. How beautiful marriage is. We thank you for understanding that we have defects. But Father, you pay the ultimate price to cover all our sins on Calvary's cross. Father, help us to be patient with our spouses. Help us to endure. And let us be able there, God, once you tarry, to love our spouses till death do us part. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen and Amen. Amen, Amen. What do you say, Amen? principles of a healthy marriage remember friends as pastor said in marriage a person comes with a radically different view of the world than you we thank you to all our 230 plus viewers in the chat would you say amen thank you and thank you thank you for sharing the message for sharing these messages um we've ended tonight and i'm i'm having mixed emotions because i'm happy for this series uh, we, we, we really were buoyed up by the word of God tonight. But as we, we have just ended the penultimate program in this grace-filled family life series. And so tomorrow is our final day. So again, share the link. Get all your friends to come out tomorrow. We want to top that 2.30. And we want this church to be really filled tomorrow as we deal with the topic, Love Revolution in the family don't miss it come out here 9 30 sharp in the morning secure your spot right here secure your spot online and get ready for the final installment of the graceful family series we want to say good night to our friends from jamaica uh, our friends from florida the united states and even right here in trinidad and tobago from my on behalf of myself and my hostess my wife and the Arima Seventh-day Adventist family, we say thank you for inviting us into your homes as you invite God into your hearts. Good night. your presence you alone are worthy of our reverence as for me and my house we will serve the Lord as for me and my house we will serve
trusting in